missing Susie Mosier, I, I often get a little concern when biophysical scientists say, when they're talking about communication or facilitation or all the rest of this stuff that has to get done to actually make decisions, they say, oh, well, that's all for the social scientists. So if you want to do communications, that must be what social scientists do. Want to do facilitation, that must be what social scientists do. And I always grit my teeth because they say, you know, there are social scientists who actually do social science. And it's science just like biophysical science. And communication is a little bit separate. Some social scientists are not very good at communication, but they're very good social scientists. Some people are very good social scientists and crummy facilitators. However, we are luckily going to hear from a person today who is not only a really good social scientist, but good at those other things as well. <laughs> wow, what a, what a thing to meet. <laughs> Okay, so this is um, the stage setter for the panel discussion that we have right after this where basically we will learn from people in communities that are working to overcome all the things that get in the way. And so um, it is also, in a, uh, I guess, a, a step forward to deepen uh, the discussion we had in Hamburg. Um, where we raised a ton of barriers and got stuck in them and, you know, oh my God, there's all these barriers and we don't get anywhere. So what I'm trying to do is to introduce to you um, a tool of sorts, uh, though for scientific purposes, for research purposes mo mainly, to identify in a systematic way where the adaptation barriers are um, and then also find out a little bit what do we know about how communities overcome them. Um, so I'll give you um, that in overview and I'll start with just a few definitions so we're clear on what we're talking about and tell you about this framework that I developed with a postdoc and then how we tested it in San Francisco Bay. So it's actually a coastal example, ex you know, just on the west coast. Uh, and give you just sample findings from that, uh, you know, just as a, uh, just to get the conversation started for the dialogue. So, whoops, we don't want this. Okay, so here we go. Um, this definition on adaptation, I just put it up because it is slightly different from the one you find by, from IPCC. IPCC assumes um, that adaptation will always minimize uh, impacts and will always lead or to, to some way of, of uh, benefiting from uh, to, or using the opportunities. And I think that's not assured. <laughs> we don't know that, whether or not adaptation will do that. So that's one important thing that I want to point out. In my thinking, it includes anything that we do sort of on a short-term basis, the little stuff, you know, just a coping with extreme events, then the more substantial adjustments, and then also some more uh, deep transformation, um, you know, in, in terms of how we interact with systems, what we get from them, uh, and, and so on. In my presentation, I want to focus on planned adaptation, and maybe it's worth discussing whether or not that also applies to sort of the reactive, ad hoc um, adaptation. We'll see, but you know, what, what we wanted to look at was planned adaptation, a thing you do consciously and deliberately. As for what are limits and barriers, we distinguish them. And it's come up a bunch of times, but it's not self-evident, and these terms are used interchangeably often, and I think wrongly. What I think is a limit, and uh, this is how we define it, is it's an absolute threshold beyond which you cannot have what you had before. You cannot use the land the way you use it. You cannot use the resource the way you use it. You cannot get the same social benefit from a system as you did before, okay? That's, or it may be a physical limit, it may be uh, of a different nature, but that's what we call it a limit, whereas a barrier is all the stuff that makes it hard. <laughs> but you can overcome it with enough effort and will and political will, whatever, uh, you know, social c uh, capital and whatnot, you can actually get over that hurdle and continue uh, achieving whatever goals you have. I want to also point out, this is not a normative statement. A barrier is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a really important thing. So for example, if you want to do adaptation but the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act or some other existing law um, puts a hurdle in your path, then, well, you might personally feel because you want to take that action, that's a bad thing. But does that make the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act a bad thing? You know, do you want to just eradicate it then? Maybe not. <laughs> so it really but depends on your personal stance toward the action that you want to take, whether or not that barrier is a very helpful thing 
And in fact, uh, I would say a lot of political actors do their darnest to put obstacles in the path of progress because they don't want to see a particular action taken, right? So we use barriers as strategic means, but it is a, it's, it's a, you know, it, it's something that as sort of a priori, I do not start from thinking of barriers only as bad things, just something you have to deal with. Okay, so let me uh, start from here. There's a barrier for you. Um, <laughs> that might be actually a limit. Anyway, um, some of the, um, so what we started out with is, uh, is a literature review that, you know, anything we could find that has talked about barriers to adaptation, and in fact, it went a little bit beyond adaptation, but typically what you hear is, oh, it's too expensive, we don't have the scientific information, we don't have the technology, politics get in the way, um, institutions are a problem, and then there's environmental side effects of doing certain things. So that's, that was sort of the, you know, the typical stuff that was thrown into almost every article um, that we could find. But it wasn't very systematically assessed, you know, when does that happen? Why does it happen? For what reasons? People use very different definitions. Um, they're, they're not necessarily complete in their assessment of the barriers that really mattered a whole range of theoretical bases that dr drove those, uh, those studies that exist so far, and certainly no clear gu guidance on how to overcome them. So that's why we wanted to go a little bit beyond that. So what we did is we actually were uh, informed by uh, Lynn Ostrom's uh, you know, approach to common resource management, uh, pool resource management. You may want to know this, it doesn't really matter. The point is that in all adaptation you have some people doing it, you have something that they want to manage, a system, a piece of coast, a water re reservoir, a piece of forest, whatever, something they want to adapt, and then the context in which they try to do it. Governance, context, the laws that pertain, uh, human environment, you know, is it a city, are you in a rural area, biophysical environment, what kind of ecosystems do you deal with? Those are the common elements in all of those instances. I'll come back to why that matters. So, you know, the people involved in the decision, this might be examples of the system, so communities, local communities, or something more specific, the laws that pertain, the ecosystems you have to deal with, and let's say we're in an economic crisis, which happened to be the case when we did this study. Anyway, so um, that might be the context, and that might make all the difference as to what matters, which barriers rise to the top, and actually how they belong together. And then, um, so those were the, what we call the structural elements of our framework. The, the second piece is a process element. In other words, when in, at what point in the adaptation process do the barriers matter, where do they occur, and what impacts do they have? So we took this very simple stylized cycle that you've seen now in, in various presentations here of you know, all decision-making processes. Um, and I just want to give you the anecdote. And when we had this paper reviewed in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, we got more than anything um, feedback for this, critique for this. Because you know, there's plenty of much more complicated uh, uh, decision-making models out there. Because the real world doesn't look so nice and circular. Sure, absolutely. We didn't care. That was not the point. It was an organizing heuristic, right? We just wanted to have something to hang our, like the scaffolding, we wanted to hang our barriers onto the typical uh, things that people do. And in fact, I'll just give you that preview. When we did talk to the decision makers in phase two, and we didn't even prime them with anything, they all came up with this cycle. So, you know, whether it's planning school that, that trains every party trains everybody to think in those terms, or whether this is simply how humans actually think about the decision making process, even if it's messy, this is where people actually could find themselves very easily in. Everybody needs to understand the issue, plan what to do, and then do something about it. As simple as that. So those were the nine uh, you know, particular periods that we looked at. So then for the diagnosis of barriers, we asked two fundamental questions. What can stop, delay, divert the process? That gets us to you know, the barrier itself. Or you might want to say at every stage in the process, what must occur for the ad adaptation process to continue? The second one is, what causes it? Why is it there? How do the actors, the context, and the system of concern, the thing that you want to manage, contribute to having that particular barrier. That's trying to get at the understanding of what's the nature of that barrier, okay? So give me, let me give you an example. The first 
uh, uh, stage here is the detection of the problem. What we ask then, this first question, what can stop, delay, divert the process is, is there a sig signal in the environment anywhere for the actor to actually know that there's a problem, right? And if there is one, does the actor actually detect it? And if they de detect it, does it raise their concern sufficiently that they think, uh-oh, it's something I should pay attention to, this is important enough. And even if they do that, do they, does it get over their threshold of concern is what we call it. Or what they maybe initially, without having thought much about it, simply think, ah, this is way too big of an issue. It's not my thing. I'm not going to do anything about it. If that happens, they will never go any further in this process, maybe until they're told to, but then that's a different signal, right? <laughs> that's the second signal that says, thou shalt do this work. Um, so anyway, this is just one example of the kinds of barriers we looked at. E at each one of these things, the process could stop or at least get held up. And then, you don't have to read all this. This is just to give you an idea. Um, for each one of these identified barriers then, we said, well, to what extent does it have to do with the actor? To what extent does it have to do with the governance context? To what extent does it have to do with the thing that you want to manage? So for example, is there a signal? Well, does a signal exist and what does it mean? Or is maybe so much variability in the system, you don't know whether, does, it, is anything happening? Well, it's just normal, right? We don't have to act yet. But if something happens persistently, that it gets, there's a clear trend that goes out of historical experience, then maybe all of a sudden people say, hmm, wait a minute. You know, we had this discussion over, um, you don't see any sea level rise in, in Beaufort. Well, if that's the case, you know, for whatever local reason, it's not just that you can't see it or you deny the science, it's maybe in that particular location, the, you know, whatever, it, there's just no sea level rise because of land movement relative to sea, right? So you personally may not see there's a relevant thing to actually do something about. So it's just that one example. Uh, and we did this for every single one. In fact, these kinds of questions, what we, we use then in the empirical testing to ask our interviewees about what is going on in their particular situations. Let me give you one last piece about this. And that gets to the question of how do we overcome this? What we ask ourselves is, well, so okay, now we know there, what barrier there is and you know, what contributes to that barrier, but then where does that actually originate? When or where did someone create that situation or um, the context or whatever the, the, the situation? So let me, we, we, what we distinguished here is a spatial or jurisdictional uh, difference between the ultimate cause for that barrier is far away. Say the federal government has made a law and I'm here in Aspen, whatever. So that's a remote uh, origin of this, right? Versus it's our local land use plan. Right? So that's, and it doesn't or d does uh, create a barrier. And it's something that we have presently control over. We can change it right now or it, it occurred really recently versus, well, this is what we've always done. Or this is how, you know, for reasons that have been established a long time ago, we have a legacy. Say we have built seawalls 50 years ago. Well, and that now causes us problems that, you know, we have to deal with. Uh, a good example from another study I'm doing right now is in Oregon. Oregon has one of the best land use uh, laws in the nation. Um, and so along the coast, it has very, very little development because of it. And much of it is in public ownership. Fewer actors and much easier to deal with than if there are, you know, we've New Jerseyized or Aspenized, whatever, uh, the, the particular location that we have to deal with, right? But this is something you don't do anything about right now. Th those, you know, this development has happened a long time ago. So we simply wanted to understand where does this come from? Do we have control over it right now? Or, you know, to what extent do we do have that? Again, you don't have to see this in detail, but what we ended up doing is we took all of those uh, barriers that we found in the literature and arranged it around this, what I call now the barrier rows, each one of these periods in a decision-making process, uh, and just simply said, okay, this is what we know from the literature so far. Now, is this complete? Is this useful? Does this cover everything? What's most important? That's what led us to project phase two, the empirical study, and where we wanted to see whether this framework helps to identify uh, the, the barriers and help us to uh, find points of intervention to overcome them, and then how transferable is it. So we'll find out.
The case studies I'll tell you about, um, it, it all occurred here in the context of San Francisco Bay. This is San Francisco Bay. San Francisco is here. Um, and what you see here actually on this map is a social vulnerability analysis that we conducted for it. The darker red areas are the highly vulnerable ones from a social perspective. Green ones somewhere in between here are the, the ones that are uh, low ver uh, variability, uh, uh, low vulnerability. And, and so this is the social context we imposed on top of that uh, different degrees of exposure to sea level rise inundation during flooding. Uh, from that. And those two were sort of the, the variables along which we wanted to vary our choices of case study. In addition to that, we wanted to make sure that the communities actually had an adaptation process so we had something to look at. Um, that we had cities and counties and in fact one regional process that is uh, bay-wide and then that the communities actually wanted to participate. So d based on these criteria and variables, we chose the city and county of San Francisco, Marin County, Santa Clara County, Hayward, um, San Francisco uh, is both city and a uh, county, and then the nine county area, uh, 101 cities around uh, the San Francisco Bay, which is trying a, a regional approach to finding a common vision uh, for how to adapt to climate change. So those were our five case studies. Um, very quickly, we did some pre preliminary uh, uh, in, uh, research just to find, you know, where are they in the process to this, this, this determine um, the, the choices, um, we did about 43 key informant interviews, all the documents that they had used in their processes to, to, uh, to date. And because it was ongoing, we had the opportunity to also be part of public processes and uh, public meetings and whatnot, workshops, to see how they're conducting that and what occurs. And then, just this is just a coincidental thing, but to put it into the larger context, I was involved in doing a uh, statewide coastal adaptation professional survey to see does what we find in these f four or five case studies actually translate to the rest of California. So uh, I'll tell you only very briefly what we did and give you then some samples. The first part, because we wanted to understand the adaptation process and in where uh, along the way do these barriers occur, we established sort of a chronology. We try to understand, you know, how, when did they start the process, where are they, how did that go on, and where are they in the decision-making process. Um, and as we found, they go through that cycle many, many times, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. The barrier analysis, so my, my postdoc and I did this together. We identified barriers, we classified them, we compared and made sure that we actually are in sync with uh, each other. Um, then we classified the barriers so that, you know, from the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of individual instances of barriers. We tried to just make sense of them uh, a little bit. And then we developed, uh, this is just one sample graphic depiction, which I'll show you more in a minute, uh, to see where in the process the adaptation barriers occur. We compared and synthesized across the five case studies and uh, provided some statistical analysis of the survey elements that related to it. So let me show you how we map this adaptation process. What we did is that we, you know, through the interviews, we learned um, when things started uh, in a particular process. This is the example of Hayward, which is the most advanced case. And we uh, put that into several distinguishable barrier, uh, periods. Um, and we did our work just about here. Um, and you see here two options in terms of how things might continue. This is just simply where the, you know, it wasn't decided yet where it goes. And people talked very much about how they anticipate the process to continue. So there is a fifth not yet realized uh, period, but people were very clear about all the barriers that will or will not occur during that time. And then for each one of them, we actually characterized them by giving them names, um, just because I was uh, very helpful to, to sort of remember the processes and what happened in each. And then for each one, we identify barriers. And I give you here just the most important. There were a lot more than this. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into detail. I just want to show you how we sort of went through this, OK? Uh, so this was the, the chronological piece. And then here is how we then organized these barriers by the different periods for each one of these uh, f uh, periods in the, in the whole history. And then, again, organized by phases and individual stages in the decision-making process. So the first period, what was called the lone, uh, you know, lone leader, whatever period, things only went from detecting the signal to defining the problem. 
and went for a long time nowhere. Um, in the second period, and that happened after a focusing event, uh, namely a flood that overtopped the local levee, um, all of a sudden the uh, city decided, hey, we've got to do something about this. So they actually uh, hired a, a consulting firm to uh, study the problem. And so in that, they also did a preliminary assessment of what the options are that one can take. It went nowhere after this. In the third phase, actually, they decided we got to implement one thing. And what they got to implement was not an action on the ground, but to build a broader coalition of people with which then they had the resources and the political will to go forward with a, a much bigger pilot study and uh, pilot implementation. So in the next phase, and these are the two options here, is where they go again through a much more uh, detailed vulnerability assessment and, uh, and options assessment, and then who knows what will happen, what they will select from that, and whether or not they will go um, forward with that evaluated. That's the, the whole point of having a pilot study that then will be monitored, evaluated, and then who knows whether it works. So the ones that are in dashed things, they are not yet realized, but basically this is what, you know, sort of how that looked. And then in the second stage of this, let me just take this particular um, uh, phase in the, in the process. We then looked at, you know, what are the key barriers that occur in that understanding uh, phase and what happens or what are the key issues that happen in the planning phase. So we can do this. We did this for every single one of the case studies in the whole, through the whole process history of barrier or of <coughs> adaptation so far. This is the, the, the sort of summary um, across all five studies. So the different colors you see are for the different cases. Uh, blue is Hayward, Marin County is orange, San Francisco green, Santa Clara red, and the regional process is the sort of brown color here. And what you find is, so let me just say, this is after the classification of the barriers that we found, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of individual things that happened. We organized them, and what we found is that institutional and governance related issues were the number one thing in the way of adaptation across these studies. Next one, and that I, I, it's my personal favorite, it's the attitudes and values of the people involved or not involved that you know, put, uh, put barriers in the process. Resources and funding, you got to understand this happened at a time when the country was in, in what California calls the Great Recession. So the worst uh, budgetary crisis of the state. And we're doing this in the richest communities across the United States. San Francisco, Santa Clara in, in Silicon Valley, Marin County, uh, and Hayward are among the most, the richest communities in the nation. And yet, during this high economic crisis, institutional issues and attitudes were more important than money. And on it goes. Just want to point out that science is relatively low here. Technology, structured technological issues that were always listed, not a big issue. Um, let me go to the next one. In terms of the sources and origins, remember here we wanted to understand the nature of the barrier. Why is it there? Well, what, this is sort of a conf confirmation of the issue that most of the barriers actually resulted or came from the governance context um, or you know, the larger, in, uh, larger context in which it occurred. The second most important had to do with the people. And I find that really, really important, both depressing but also really hopeful <laughs> because people you can do something about, right? People are the ones who move the governance barriers. In the least of the cases, it was because of the system at hand, which I think is also very important. That's not where the big issue is. It's with our human systems uh, and the people. Now, this is the other thing in terms of the, the intervention points, um, the summary of the origins. Does it you know, date back to far away, I'm almost there, far away, close by, currently, or uh, from a legacy? The important point that I want to point out is that most of them are local. Most of them are within the sphere of influence of the decision makers right now. That's really important. Secondly, is this one. Again, the majority, slight majority, dates from things we've done in the past. To me, that means we have to be really, really careful about what we put in place now because that will be the problem for the ones coming next when things get tougher. Okay, so both hopeful and important insights. 
Now, interestingly enough, it's, it, I, I have this, uh, it's a repeat experience in, in my career. Um, my dissertation was on uncertainty and people didn't like talking about uncertainty because they felt it was a critique of their professional uh, prowess. And when you ask people about barriers, it's the same thing. People were just adamant about talking about the things that work and that help and all the things that are good. And so that's an important point that we didn't have in our, uh, in our tool before. So what we learned is that personal qualities are the most important aids and advantages that help prevent coming across barriers in the first place. Next after that is if you have actually related or relevant policies that you can play with, things you can move your things into, right? The whole idea of, of mainstreaming. Leadership was the third most important thing. We heard that a number of times. The, the next one was existing vulnerabilities or perceived impacts. And that, interestingly enough, in California, did not have a focusing event. We didn't have any recent flood or you know, anything that, that really um, uh, disturbed these communities personally, if you will. But it's, we have a wealth of information that heightened people's awareness of what could happen in the region. Now, what did they use as strategies to overcome the barriers? Um, and this is, again, normalized by case here and, and summarized for each of them. The most important one was communication. When you have no money and have no place to go and you're stovepiped in you know, all your departments, the number one you have to do is to build the co coalitions and uh, uh, communication relationships. Let's see, networking, informal relationship building, cooperation, formalized partnerships, that's what all of them did. It's adaptive capacity building. It's not building structures and dikes and floodgates and whatnot or whatever, it's, you know, the, the human, on the human side is where people uh, are working. And then finally, we, uh, build sort of the, the policy playing field in which you can integrate adaptation in the future. So finally then, what that leads me to believe is that the challenge of governance is that you sort of find ways to address the institutional issues and bring in, in effective ways, leadership with po political calculus, the knowledge that is there, limited as it is, I found that often not to be at all in, uh, important, work in the face of limited costs and within the context of social uh, uh, acceptability. So the art of governance is really what will help us to overcome barriers. Um, very quick conclusion on this is that I think we produce a much richer picture of the barriers that mattered uh, and in a, a very systematically or th theoretically founded way. Um, it worked re really well to identify it. It was labor intensive, like I didn't, don't ever want to do this again. Um, I'll just say that. So uh, some barriers line up well with the phases and stages of this decision cycle. Others span multiple ones. Um, and they're also interconnected. So for example, an economic uh, contextual barrier, say through the economic crisis that affects staffing, that affects you know, how much money you have for planning, how much money you have for implementation and so on and so forth. Uh, the source of barriers or temporal jurisdictional origin was sometimes difficult to identify, but it actually was really in, uh, info, in, interesting uh, aids and advantages and the measures of importance or how difficult it is to overcome barriers is what people really wanted to know. Um, and so maybe we ought to move to something simpler um, and not just have a descriptive, but maybe a predictive uh, tool in the future. So I'll stop with that. And thank you for all the people helped. Uh, I'd like to have the panelists come up, uh, if they would, and uh, do you want to bring chairs up here and just kind of turn them around? Is there a question or, or two for Susie while the panelists are assembling? James. Yeah, James. So, sorry if you, if you kind of caveated this already, but um, the slide that you showed, the distribution of barriers among governance and technology and science, et cetera, wouldn't that, isn't that kind of a function on, in terms of what the adaptation measure is? I mean, like, the, if you were trying to, and, and also the magnitude of the change you're trying to adapt to, because, you know, if you have a near-term uh, challenge that is not large, then you can envision governance having a larger role to play in, in, in impeding that action. But if it was a longer term, far more uncertain, far more technical, then the other types of barriers would seem to start to escalate in importance. I think it is a snapshot of the timing, not, not the dependence on the type of adaptation measures, but on the early uh, 
phase in which we are. Um, people are so early in the process um, in terms of, you know, just beginning to plan, uh, just beginning to, to even assess what their risks are, what the possibilities are. When you get down to <coughs> regulation, when you get down to, you know, should we build that seawall <coughs> this high or that high, you know, where should we exactly place our outflows from the sewer, whatever system, then you need better science. But nobody is in that place. Um, and additional to that, the San Francisco and California in general is probably wealthier in science and understanding of what the uh, possibilities are and what, what climate change might mean than most other places in the country. Um, it has for years it had a uh, state supported research program that has developed a lot of regionally and, and locally specific information and so you know there's just so much research capacity there. If I had done this in I don't know rural Iowa or something like that or, or Kentucky or something Alabama it would have been a whole different picture yeah. um, but for this region um, you know it's it's it wasn't a big issue. I, I will say though um, that it's consistent with everything else that I have seen from people who have used this framework in other regions. Science is not the driver at this stage because at this stage there will be leaders who will run with the idea and what they have seen is sufficient to get them motivated to start. They don't need more. But it, you will need it later. Yeah. Thanks again.